The Warrior 64 is a replacement case and HDMI mod for the Nintendo 64 that just completed a Kickstarter campaign. While it's an interesting idea, what it represents and how the company marketed it sparked some important discussions about the device, as well as Kickstarter campaigns and retro gaming products in general. Let's take a look and see what this product's all about. Before I begin, I'll have to say that there was controversy surrounding the Warrior 64 pretty much immediately upon its announcement, and while in my opinion there are some things to like about it, I wanted to prove without a shadow of a doubt that all the things wrong with it are facts that can be measured and proven, not opinions. And also, I think what this project and everything surrounding it represents is a lot more important than just the Warrior 64. So hopefully you'll stick around to the end and see how all the problems and the way that this project was kind of approached by the people doing it really apply to a lot of what's wrong with retro gaming products these days. So let's jump in and get started. The Warrior 64 kits can be purchased two ways, either as a completed unit that's ready to go or as a kit that you install yourself. The completed set sold for $150 and ships in a professional looking box. It comes with a console itself in either clear green or clear black, as well as AV cables, a power supply, an HDMI cable, and a controller. And sandpaper. I swear this isn't a joke, they actually included a piece of sandpaper and tell you to sand the contacts of your game, then blow in it if it doesn't work. Please do not do this. Just use a pink pencil eraser and some alcohol. Anything abrasive like sandpaper will scrape the contacts on the cart, causing them to oxidize, and very quickly the cart will become unfixable. So right off the bat we have to acknowledge two things. First, if everything works as advertised, $150 is actually a great value for all of those components. However, any company that tells you to sand down the contacts of your cartridges clearly has no grasp on how retro gaming electronics work. I mean, did they see that GameSack video and it didn't know that Joe was kidding? Anyway. The controller seemed decent quality and about what you'd expect in an aftermarket controller. It seemed a bit small for my hands, but I'm kind of used to that. Whether you think it's good or not will definitely come down to personal preference, but it certainly wasn't the worst N64 controller I've seen. They sell it separately for $25, and it feels better than some other controllers at that price point. The new console case itself seems really high quality, and is definitely not some flimsy piece of plastic. Some people might not like the style, but the quality was good, and I thought it looked much better in person than in the pictures. I honestly like it, and if my N64's case ever cracked or broke, I think it would be neat to swap it out with this one. But that brings up a question. Where did they get the N64 motherboards for the 250 fully completed units they sold, and what did they do with the old shells? I found it odd that not many people questioned that, as the retro gaming community seemed to be in an uproar when Analog did the same thing with the original NT as that console used chips from salvaged Famicoms, and the original parts were presumably destroyed. Now, I guess you could argue that if they purchased those N64s, they're entitled to do absolutely anything they want with them. However, how would you feel if you found out a whole bunch of perfectly good N64s got destroyed in order to salvage these motherboards? And also, how do you feel about a company who thinks it's okay to sand your cartridges as the same company that's going to be installing these kits into the console that you're buying? That's a pretty freaky thought, and it's gonna get worse as this video goes on. Now on to the internals. Once you take the lid off, the first thing you'll notice is the HDMI board on top. This is essentially one of those cheap RGB to HDMI cables, but in board form. It's terrible. I'll demonstrate why later. Removing the motherboard reveals how they're getting the RGB signals they're converting to HDMI, which will be different based on console revision. See, older N64s already generate RGB, but the signals aren't run to the multi-out. For those models, they simply tap RGB from resistors that are connected to the lines, and they're getting sync from composite video. That fourth wire is voltage. As a note, newer models of the N64 require a much more complicated method to get RGB. 
If you'd like more info on this, RetroRGB.com's N64 section has all the details you'll need. Now let's take a look at the do-it-yourself kit. This sold for $95 and came with the same quality shell, a screwdriver to help disassemble the original console, mod boards that will work with all models of the N64, and brand new screws, which I think was a really nice touch as many N64s are missing screws. Here's a big problem with this kit. The Kickstarter campaign advertised this as plug and play. Now, technically, if you're just swapping out the case, that's true, but these mod boards are far from plug and play, and that marketing was very misleading. After I first brought this to the community's attention, many people contacted Kickstarter and reported the campaign as misleading. Kickstarter responded to all of them and said it wasn't in violation of their policies. So basically, they don't care. Anyway, let's take a closer look. One of the RGB boards they include is an updated version of the one they installed in the fully completed unit I just showed, and it's designed for all of the first few revision N64s that use a chip labeled VDC-NUS. These aren't too hard to install as there's only RGB and power to connect. Please note that these boards get synced from the S-Video's Luma pins. More on that in a sec. The other board they include is for all later model N64s, including the Fantastic ones. This is a much more complicated installation and requires you to solder one of these adapter boards to small pins on the motherboard, then connect a supplied ribbon cable to the larger main board. To be blunt, these boards are terrible and so poorly designed, which is nuts because there's free, open source designs available for N64 RGB mods that they could have used. Here's a few quick things to point out. First, both the prototype board and the basic board in the kit split RGB before they run the signals through a video amp. That means even though you've technically RGB modded the console, you can't use an RGB cable with it as you're splitting the signals without a buffer. Even if you don't have the HDMI cable plugged in, the circuit is still active, so you could never use the RGB output. It's like they installed the circuit backwards. Also, these boards use Luma as sync, and like with RGB, it doesn't appear to be properly buffered. That means you can't use S-Video if your Warrior 64 uses the basic install kit shown here. This is just insane to me. Building these boards the right way would have added zero cost to the design. It just makes no sense. The Advance Kit has its own set of issues too. First, it doesn't connect RGB to the multi-out at all, which, once again, is nuts since you're literally RGB modding the console to get HDMI. All the signals look to be pulled digitally though, so you should be able to use composite and S-Video without any trouble. So what does all of this mean in real-world terms? Simply put, if the boards that they shipped in production units are like any of the ones I'm showing here, using analog outputs at all might be harmful, or just won't work. Now, based on what they've told myself and another reputable reviewer, it looks like two of the three boards I'm showing will be used for production and still have some issues. So I definitely recommend opening up your Warrior 64 or checking out the kits before installing and checking to make sure which one you have. Let's take a look. If you see this board and specifically this pin soldered, you can't use RGB or S-Video in either single or dual output scenarios. If you see this board, and specifically this pin, the one next to Luma soldered in, that means they use some prototype boards in production, and you'll have to run one more test to know which outputs are safe to use. Connect the HDMI output of the Warrior 64 to one monitor, and then connect composite video to another. I'm showing RGB here as I already threw out the other board, more on that in a second, but it should react the same. If you plug in composite video and the HDMI output gets darker, you shouldn't use the analog outputs at all. Now, if Luma is used as sync, you won't see a brightness drop if you plug in an S-Video cable, but you probably will see the Intec board lose signal when you unplug it. So this dual output test is still a decent way to test this board without opening your console. I'd still suggest doing both just to be sure though. Also, here's what the Luma signal looks like on an oscilloscope, proving there is a voltage drop when an S-Video cable is connected, which means that double the signal is being pulled from the chip, which is absolutely terrible for the chips in the N64. 
Now, if you open the Warrior 64 and see this advanced kit, which both looks different and has a second ribbon cable installed, you should be fine to use composite in this video, but I'd run the dual output test I just showed anyway, just to confirm. Better safe than sorry. I'd like to point out that nowhere in their Kickstarter campaign did they raise any concerns about using the analog outputs, and my guess is they genuinely have no clue how bad it is to split analog video signals this way, which is really weird because this should be common knowledge for anybody working in the retro gaming world. Now, on the other hand, using the HDMI output should be perfectly safe, but I'm not sure if you'd want to. This HDMI board is the same exact garbage that's in the Pound, Hyperkin, X-Agent, and Level Hike cables. And it looks like this might even be the same group that operates under the name Level Hike. These cables scale the image to 720p, which actually looks nice on still images, but as soon as there's movement on the screen, things get a shaky and blurry look. This is because the chips all of these companies use were designed for 480i TV signals, not 240p video game signals. If the only issue was image quality, I'd barely even mention it, as it's definitely better than plugging your N64 directly into the composite input of a flat panel TV. The real issue here is lag. See, all of the HDMI cables based off this same scaling chip were designed for TV signals, not video games. And as a result, they add a lot of variable lag to the output, and the variable part is the problem. See, most TVs these days have around one frame of lag in game mode, but it's always one frame. That means after a few minutes of playing, most people just naturally adjust to the speed difference from playing retro consoles on a zero lag TV. If the lag is always all over the place, like with this kit, it's impossible to get used to it because it's always changing. I didn't just want to describe this to you, I wanted to show proof so I removed the RGB amp from the board and wired in my own RGB and sync connectors. I then used a time sleuth set to 240p, the main resolution of the N64, and sent that to the RGB S pads I tapped onto the board. As you can see here, the lag is variable between 50 and 35 milliseconds of lag, which is about two to three frames. If you add the average lag of a flat panel TV, that's three to five frames of variable lag added to N64 games. Switching to 480i shows the same exact results. Now, I've covered my lag testing setup extensively in other videos, but I wanted to prove once again that my test equipment does not add any lag at all. So I'm removing the Warriors HDMI scaler and replacing it with an open source scan converter. This is the exact same setup minus the sync combiner, and as you could clearly see, we're showing zero milliseconds of lag near the top. If you'd like more details, including proof that a sync combiner doesn't add lag, please check out those other videos for all the proof you'd need, as well as more info on how bad some of these scalers are for retro gaming. Unfortunately, there's so many people spreading misinformation about lag and how these cables work that I need to make sure I'm very clear about this point. If these HDMI cables using the wrong HDMI chip and circuit weren't entertainment devices, and instead were devices like GPSs or thermometers, they would all be pulled from the market and the companies that made them would be sued. The fact that they're entertainment devices kind of put them along the same path as something like that $5 toaster that you get from Walmart. I'm sure anybody growing up that needed a cheap toaster has been through this. It either burns the heck out of your bread or doesn't toast it at all, but it won't burn your house down, so it's still allowed to be sold. So that's pretty much where all of these HDMI cables lie. They don't really do what they're supposed to, but they don't hurt anything, so they're still allowed to be sold. So let's step back for a second and put the whole project in perspective. I'll start with the positive points. First, if you only bought the kit to replace a broken case on your current N64, then I'd actually call it a win. Some people seem to hate the look, but I like it. It does make me a bit nervous that they don't use all the same mounting holes as the original, but the way the case is designed should prevent it from flexing too much. Next, if you bought the pre-installed kit with the intention of streaming via HDMI and gaming on a CRT, it might still be a win. I'd definitely open the console and check which board is installed, like I showed earlier, but hopefully you could at least use composite video. But what if you backed this Kickstarter campaign, thinking the HDMI kit is plug-and-play like the title implied? 
Or what if you bought the pre-installed one expecting a good quality HDMI output instead of just the cheap $10 cable bundled inside? Unfortunately, there might not be anything you could do, which really stinks because every time a project like this is allowed to move forward, that just tells these companies that the retro gaming world will still buy this crap even though the companies that make them probably know how bad they are. And also unfortunately, because it's kind of a smaller Kickstarter, it might be too small of a project for a lawyer to take on for a class action lawsuit. And of course, as I've already shown, Kickstarter really doesn't care as long as they get their cut. But there is a light at the end of the tunnel. As long as you're not afraid of doing a little bit of modding, I can make these kits not suck. So let's take a look at what we can do with them. Okay, let's start with a completed unit. The first thing you want to do is remove whatever piece of junk board they installed. You'll probably need a heat gun for this, and it could be a bit complicated for a beginner. Please note that while I was heating the board, I had a pick underneath, but I was not pulling up on the board. I simply put a tiny bit of pressure on the bottom side, and when the solder got hot enough, it came right off. Definitely do not pull, or it could harm the motherboard. If there's any excess solder on the pins after removing, just use solder braid and a soldering iron to clean it up. You might want to add a tiny bit of fresh solder as well when you're done. Now, if the N64 motherboard you're looking to use is one of the later models that requires the advanced RGB installation, you might want to just carefully remove everything that Intec installed, or if you're talking about the kit, not use it at all, only because it's a much more complicated install than the basic board. If you're looking for HDMI output, maybe remove everything, put it back to stock, and either use a RAD 2X or a RetroTINK Mini or pretty much any of the RetroTINK products in order to get your HDMI output. You could always install the N64 Advanced RGB kit, but it's definitely not for beginners. But if your N64 is an older one that could accept the easy RGB mod, I'd recommend picking up something like the Voltar board I have here. You could just drop it on top of the multi-out pins and solder it right in place. It's about as easy as you could imagine, and you could even reuse the RGB wires from the other installation. Just snip off the connector, strip the wires, and use those. I need to warn you though, that fourth wire is not sync. That's 3.3 volts which is used to power the HDMI board, and you could kill any device you connect if you plug that onto the sync line. I reused the wire, but moved it to the correct sync pad. Just check the installation instructions on RetroRGB.com for more info. Before you finish, make sure to bend the metal tab on the bottom plate before reassembling. If you don't, it could short out the RGB board and kill your console. The Intec gaming boards are shaped in a way that just misses the metal, but these properly designed boards require that slight mod to the metal. So if your N64 motherboard is one of the older revisions, either converting or installing an RGB mod that's made properly is actually pretty cool. You'll end up with an N64 with a pretty unique case that outputs all analog video signals safely. But this is the Retro RGB channel, and I think you all know I'm not going to stop there. What if we install an HDMI board that doesn't suck? Now, I'd have loved to install an Ultra HDMI kit, but those things are expensive and impossible to get. So instead, I contacted Mike Chi, the creator of the RetroTINK and RAD2X products, and asked if he could send me a spare RAD2X board. Mike sent one over, and I got started right away at modding it in. My original plan was to mount the RAD2X on top of the Intec HDMI board, so I had to clean it up and prepare it. First, I had to remove the harness I installed to test lag. Then I figured I'd use a heat gun to try and remove all the components from the top of the board to essentially turn it from a board into a mounting piece. It was taking a bit too long, and then I realized something. Okay, I've always wanted to try this. Now, please don't ever, ever do this on any board that you actually need to keep. But since all we're doing is using this board as a brace, well, let me just show you. This was so much freaking fun to do. Unfortunately, I got so excited that I'd finally be able to try this that I forgot to remove the switch, which we actually need to use later on. That ended up catching fire, but f it, this is awesome. Oh, and before you trolls start to get at me for having a dirty stovetop, I didn't bother cleaning after cooking dinner that day, knowing I'd want to absolutely scrub the stove clean after doing this. 
I figured I'd just wait until afterwards. Also, even though I had my custom exhaust fan running the whole time, doing this made my kitchen stink for about a full day. I'd never recommend doing this, but damn, it was fun in this one specific situation. So now that we have a perfectly clean board, I wanted to try and use it as a mount. I tried a few different positions, and it almost looked like I could have mounted it in front of the existing HDMI hole by using industrial strength double-sided tape, both to isolate and secure the board. Unfortunately, the cartridge slot ran right along where the board would sit, making that impossible. I'm kind of glad though, as it prevented me from using the lazy solution, and instead forced me to do something that looked much better. So I decided to use an HDMI extension and mount the board elsewhere. I carefully drilled holes by hand into the plastic HDMI bracket in order to mount an HDMI extension cable directly into it. After doing a test fit, it seemed the cartridge slot was in the way of the rubber shielding, so I trimmed some off. And then I trimmed a bit too much off and cut one of the wires inside. Luckily, I bought a second one, so I just recut it in only the places that absolutely needed trimming, and now the top cover seemed to fit just fine when placed on top of it. It didn't fit on the bottom side though, so I had to trim that mounting board, which I did off camera. Since the HDMI cable bolted right into the plastic, I only needed the mounting board for the switch. Also, I had to replace that switch with a new one since I set the other one on fire. And for the record, that's the first time I have ever lost a part to fire. And it's hysterical to me. Now that the mounting solution was settled, it was time to tap the video, audio, and power signals we needed. Unlike Level Hike, or in tech gaming, I connected the RGB lines to the output of the video amp. I also connected it to the side of the resistors facing the chip, so it was splitting the signal before either side hits the output circuit. Both the THS7374 on the Voltar board and the THS7314 Intec used is 100% designed to support up to two outputs, which is another reason it was so ridiculous they didn't wire theirs this way. Also, since this board was properly designed, I was able to tap sync this way as well, making it totally safe to use any of the analog outputs and HDMI at the same time. Next, I needed to connect power, ground, and audio, and I figured for wire routing reasons, I'd get them all from the multi-out as well. As I proved in a previous video, it's totally safe to split audio output this way, but not video output. Check out the link in the description if you're interested in the full technical explanation. Now, if this was a project I planned on doing to more than one N64, I'd have asked one of my amazing friends in the retro gaming community to design a custom board that makes all of these signals easy to tap. In fact, I probably could have had the signals broken out to a JST connector that plugged right into the RAD 2X, but since I only plan on doing this one time, I did it manually. After I got everything soldered together, I wanted to check some different mounting locations. I carefully put it all together while routing the wires in a way that would both prevent them from getting pinched and allow for a safe place to mount the RAD 2X. I ended up choosing the heatsink as that's where experts have determined is the best place to mount the advanced RGB boards, so I figured it would be good enough for this as well. Before connecting them to the RAD 2X, I needed to add resistors to the RGBS lines. The RGB lines need 75 ohm resistors, and I ended up using a 470 ohm resistor on the sync line. This is to make sure the RAD 2X received the same voltage it would get when plugged into the multi-out. Forgetting to add these would have sent too much voltage and could possibly have killed the RAD 2X. At the very least, it would be way too bright to use. Also, any eagle-eyed viewer might notice that I actually used the wrong resistor on the sync line here. I realized it right after this, and you'll see the correct one in the next shot. Before I reassembled, there was one last mod to perform. I wanted to move the RAD2X's filter switch over to the Intec board so you could toggle it externally. I carefully removed the original, then soldered wires to the pads. Then I matched those wires to the same exact pins on the external switch. Like with the RGB board, if this was a project I planned on doing multiple times, I'd have asked a friend to create a replacement for the Intec board that made connecting the RAD2X easier. I really only plan on doing this once, so a mess of wires it is. 
After everything was connected, I added some tape to isolate the boards from any metal it might touch, as well as isolate the switch pins. I then carefully reassembled and re-ran the wires around in the safe location I determined earlier. It was a bit messy, but electrically fine. Please note that while I'm friends with some incredibly talented modders, I am nowhere near in their league. Even without a custom board, a pro could have made this look even better, but my job definitely did the trick. All exposed pins were properly isolated and everything felt secure. Heck, even the HDMI adapters ended up working out fine since they braced the RAD2X board in place. While it's not the prettiest solution, it's durable. Then I just bolted the motherboard in place and put the top cover back on. I had to wiggle the right angle HDMI adapter so the top would fit over it, but it ended up working fine. It's kind of neat that you could see the RAD2X through the top, and it certainly hides the mess of the wires inside. The rear ports are the best part though. It looks pretty much stock, even with the screws holding the new HDMI port in place. After powering it on, the console works exactly as I hoped. The RAD2X looks the same as if it was plugged directly into the back, but having it wired internally allows for a perfectly safe dual output. Basically, after about a day's worth of work, the Warrior 64 is now everything it should have been, and technically even better since you could use the RAD2X's filter that the Warrior board doesn't offer. The switch seems to work perfectly fine with the external switch I connected to it as well. I usually leave the filter on at all times with the N64 though, but it's cool to have the option available right there. There's one more option that's not as crazy, but if you have an older N64 motherboard compatible with the basic mod, you could at least use all outputs at the same time if you'd like. As with before, start by removing the piece of junk basic board they installed, or if you bought a kit, just don't install the RGB board at all. Then install a quality RGB amp like this one. You might be able to do this with an N64 advanced kit on later motherboards as well, but I'd absolutely check with a board designer first, both to see if it's safe and to confirm exactly where to tap the RGBS signals. Just like before, if you're using this basic board, tap RGBS from the side of the resistors that face the amp's output pins. Then connect audio, power, and ground, as well as the 3.3 volt power from the motherboard. Now carefully run all those cables around the board and solder them directly to the input points on the HDMI board. You should double check all points with a multimeter as the board you receive might be a different revision than this one here. Now you might notice that the switch is missing from this board because I used it to replace the one that caught fire. Sorry, that's still cracking me up. But on the Warrior 64 boards, the switch is only used to toggle a 16x9 mode, which you'd never want to use anyway. With the switch removed, it always outputs 4x3 video, so I don't miss it at all. Now you can safely use RGB, S-Video, and composite video along with the HDMI output. The HDMI signal is still going to be pretty crappy, and due to the lag, I certainly wouldn't use it for gaming, but this setup here is actually a really cool streaming rig. Just game on a CRT and connect the Warrior's HDMI output to pretty much any capture card, and it'll certainly be good enough for that. So hopefully I was able to present the information in this video well enough that a conclusion isn't even necessary. Now I'm sure once the comments come rolling in I'll realize that certain sections of the video could have been a little bit clearer, but I'm always trying my best and I'm always trying to improve with each one. Also I realize that there's always going to be a group of people that once they've spent their money on something refuse to believe it's anything other than awesome, which kind of makes me sad because I feel like if I did a better job explaining this stuff I might be able to get through to some of those people. Anyway, I'd like to thank Metal Jesus for paying out of pocket to sending me both of these Warrior 64 units, as without having both here, I really wouldn't have been able to get a sense of the different kits that they use and what's actually going to be arriving to customers. Of course, I'd also like to thank Mike Chi for sending me the Rad 2X board, and I'd like to thank Electron Ash for painstakingly going over every minute detail of these boards with me to make sure that I got my facts straight and that all of the information presented in this video is 100% accurate. Also, since both of these units are now in a workable state, finally, I'd like to do a giveaway with at least one of them, so please stay tuned to any of the social media accounts that I post on, and I'll have more information soon. Thanks very much for watching. If you'd like to learn more about all the amazing products and people in retro gaming, 
please check out the rest of this YouTube channel, as well as the website, which has tons of info to get you started. There's also a weekly podcast that keeps everyone in the loop of everything going on in the retro gaming scene, available as a video and everywhere podcasts are found. And most importantly, if you'd like to help keep the work we do alive, please consider signing up for any of our support services. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.